Hi everyone, Colleen Reinders here. I miss you. I miss seeing you all. I miss seeing your smiles and hearing your joyful singing. But I'm so happy to welcome you this morning to our service. And if you're watching now live, we'd love for you to sign in on the chat and, and just say hi. Next week is the annual GEMS conference. For those of you that don't know, GEMS stands for Girls Everywhere Meeting the Savior. It's a worldwide club that teaches great truths to girls, young girls from ages 7 to 14. And our church is privileged to have one of those clubs. But because of COVID-19, we weren't able to meet in person. So my band was asked to spend a couple of days recording some worship sessions at our church building with Colin and his crew. And I'm so excited that this morning we'll be joining in the band with the band in worship. The theme for the conference is unshakable. This was picked well before COVID. Wow, God knew. You may be going through some difficult times right now, either because of COVID or for some other reason. Please know that God is with you. Psalm 16 verse 8 says, I know the Lord is always with you. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Can we make a declaration this morning? Let's declare that even though we still can't meet together, and it might be kind of awkward sitting in your kitchen with your family, and I know that for some of you these are really hard times, can we say this together three times with different emphasis? I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. And again, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. And lastly, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Let's sing that together. If you'd stand up and sing along with us, you're going to find the words on the screen. Songs are easy to sing. And it'll be really wonderful to know that together we're worshiping the Lord. Let's do that together. Ready? Two, three, four.
my name is Steve and I am a deacon at Clergy. This week we are partnering with the JFJ Hope Center. They are an organization that helps build families and changes lives. You may remember the campaign from a few years ago, the baby bottle campaign where we put coins in baby bottles. This is the same organization. The JFJ Hope Center provides support to women and men from all ethnic and religious affiliations. They provide emotional support to parents and families. The Hope Center is also a ministry licensed adoption agency, the full range of services. They provide valuable education programs. They have a great website, the jfjhopecenter.ca. There are a few ways of giving, online, e-transfer, by text, or by using the Planning Center app. Thank you for your time and God bless your giving this morning. Thank you. Well, hello again, and a special uh, hello and welcome to everyone from Clearview CRC. Um, it's an honor to be sharing God's word with you uh, at this time as well. And we're going to be reading from, and I'm going to be preaching on, uh, continuing in our Apocalypse Now series on Apocalypse Now. We've been looking through the entire scripture, looking at the different apocalypses that God gives to his people, to human beings throughout the Bible. And uh, last week, Pastor Leah preached on the book of Revelation, um, the book that we often associate with the apocalypse. And today we're reading from the book of Daniel, a book that also has this word apocalypse found throughout it. Uh, although it's not literally the word apocalypse because Daniel is written in Hebrew, so it's the word, the Hebrew word for that, galah. But we've learned through this series, Pastor Leah talked about it and Eric and I have talked about it, that the word apocalypse doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means. Uh, it doesn't mean the end of the world or, or some big uh, cataclysmic event. Apocalypse translated into English just means revelation. And apocalypse can also be a verb. You know, someone can apocalypse something to you. They can reveal something to you. So today we're going to be reading from Daniel chapter 2. Oh God's apocalypse to King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And we're going to start a halfway through verse 24 because it's a pretty long chapter. But I'm going to quickly recap uh, what uh, happens in the first half of the chapter. So God gives Nebuchadnezzar this apocalypse in this form of a dream and of a vision. It's very disturbing for the king. He doesn't really know what it means and what's going on. And so he goes to his advisors and he asked them to not just interpret the dream for him, but to also tell him what the dream was. He doesn't tell them what it is. And unsurprisingly, the uh, advisors say, uh, Oh, king, we can't do that. <laughs> Only the gods could do that. But in this rage, Nebuchadnezzar says, If you don't tell me what the dream was or, and interpret it to me, I'm going to put you all to death. I'm going to kill every last one of you. And so... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar commands this other official named Arioch to go and to put to death his advisors, which include Daniel. And uh, this Arioch guy goes to Daniel's house, and Daniel manages to figure out what's going on, buy some time from the king, and he goes to his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he tells them, we need to pray. We need to pray to our God, the one true God, and ask him to reveal to us what this dream was. And miraculously, God does show Daniel and his friends of what Nebuchadnezzar's dream was and what the meaning was. And that's where we jump into the story. Uh, Daniel, 2, chapter, Daniel chapter 2, verse 24. Before I read, before I share God's word with you, uh, let's pray. Father, send your Holy Spirit to to reveal to us right now in this moment what you want us to know, what you want us to see. God, continue to apocalypse to your people, to reveal to your people your good news, your comfort, your truth. God, speak through me this time so that the, the words in my mouth and the meditations of our hearts may be pleasing to you, O oh God. Amen. So Daniel chapter 2, starting at verse 24. 
Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. And he said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. So Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, No. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed were these. See, as your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation, that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked... And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The statue, the head of the statue, was made of pure gold, and its arms of silver, and its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out but not by human hands. And this rock, it struck struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, all smashed, were broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now I, we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, He has made you ruler ruler over them all. You, O king, are the head of gold. And after you, another kingdom will arise, but inferior to yours. Next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. And finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron with mixed clay. As the toes are partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then, King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate, flat on his face, bowing down before Daniel, and paid him honor and ordered that an offering of incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer 
of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. And the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lately, I've been getting these interesting emails from various companies that I uh, subscribe to or that I, I buy from. And th- all these emails have a similar language or a similar tone in them. They, they usually say, in these uncertain times, we want you to know that we're here for you. Or, or in these unsettling times, we want you to know that we're still here. I've, I think I've even got one of these emails from like Subway because I ordered from them online or something. It's kind of funny to imagine Subway still being there for me. But anyways, all, all these companies, whether it's my bank or a restaurant, have been connecting with me and emailing me, telling me, in these unsettling times, we're here for you. I'm interested in, in that terminology. That, that all these companies seem to be using in these uncertain, unsettled times. What exactly make these times so unsettled? Is it that you know, we had plans that fell through and, and that's why we're living in an uncertain time? Is it this global pandemic that has killed so many and, and made so many sick that makes time, these times unsettled? Or is it that we have this increasing feeling that we don't really have control over anything around us anymore? Is that unsettling? And really, it's it's all of that. All of that contributes to this feeling of uncertainty and, and being unsettled. And that word unsettled perfectly describes the main character in our story, our Bible passage today as well. King Nebuchadnezzar. He was incredibly unsettled. When he gets these dreams from God, these visions, this apocalypse from God, the the vision itself is disturbing to him, but also because he has no idea what it means. He, He has this lack of understanding, a lack of control over knowing. And even though he has all these advisors that he probably pays pretty handsomely to be part of his his royal court, none of them can tell him what it means, can tell him the dream. He becomes incredibly distrustful of them. That's, I think, why he forces them to tell him not only the interpretation, but the dream. And this, this unsettledness, this fear, turns into rage. Nebuchadnezzar lashes out and he threatens to kill all these people. Because even though we read in the beginning of Daniel chapter 2, you can read that, It's just the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He feels the kingdom slipping through his fingers. He feels like the control he thought he had is slowly fading away. And then Daniel comes into the story. And finally, when Daniel speaks to the king, we we hear what this dream really was. It's a dream of, of a of a dazzling, enormous, awesome statue. We have gold and and silver and bronze and iron and and even clay. And this statue, even though it's so enormous and made of strong materials like iron or materials representing wealth and power like gold, it gets broken into pieces by this strange stone, this stone cut from a mountain, not by human hands, meaning that it's, it's a divine stone. If it's not cut by humans, it's cut by God. The stone comes down and it, it smashes the statue at its weakest point, the point of the clay. And that caused the whole entire statue to shatter into dust. Like it says it's like chaff, like chaff on a threshing floor. Chaff is the little pieces of wheat that, that we don't turn into bread, that we don't turn into flour. It's the little thin 
pieces that come off of the piece of the wheat plant and they get blown away by the wind because they're so thin and, and so, so small and brittle. And just like chaff, a wind comes by, a, a breeze comes by and it blows this dust of the statue away so, so that there's nothing left. I don't know if you've ever seen the, the Avengers movies, but if you've seen the movie Infinity War, it's like when Thanos snaps his fingers and half of the universe is just turned into this ashy dust and fades away. That's what happens to this statue, this mighty statue. And Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, this statue represents you and your kingdom and the kingdoms that will come from your kingdom. Your legacy is not as solid as you thought it was. The amount of control that you think you had is not as strong as you think it is. This kingdom you have built is far more fragile than you realized. And King Nebuchadnezzar is very unsettled by this. By this apocalypse that comes from God. And today, we have gotten a similar apocalypse from God, a similar revelation right now in 2020. It might not have been in the form of a vision or a dream, but it's a clear sign clear message that the little kingdoms that we have built, the figurative human kingdoms that we build, are also far more fragile than we realized. It's unsettling. I'll explain further. We don't build literal kingdoms like Babylon, like King Nebuchadnezzar, but we do build things that we feel like we have control over. And we build our businesses and the companies that we work for and the jobs that we have. We put all our, our blood, sweat, and tears, time, and, and even financial investment into these companies. And we, we feel like we have control over them. We feel like they are our personal kingdoms. We literally sometimes refer to them as economic empires. Those are little kingdoms that we build. Or with our daily schedule, with the, all the sports we play or the people we, we try and spend time with and see and know, we build this little kingdom of busyness, of playing hockey or, or soccer or, or join the swim team or baseball, whatever it is, four or five nights a week sometimes, meeting with people so often as we can, thinking that that gives us control over our life. We build this this little kingdom of the sports we play or our, our busy lives and schedules that we make. Or maybe you are building a little kingdom around your academics, around the, the things that, the, the, the classes that you take and the, and the grades that you, you try and achieve. And we put all this time into um, trying to get the right scholarships get into the, the schools that we want to get into. And we build this little academic kingdom that we want to have control over. Or maybe the little kingdom that we build is ourselves, literally our bodies. We try and not just take care of ourselves, but have complete control over how we look and how we feel. We go to the gym four or five days a week. We, we diet and and make sure that we don't eat certain foods and eat a lot of other certain foods just so we look a very specific way and have control over our bodies. All these things are little kingdoms that we try and build. But in this season of 2020, it has been clearly revealed to us that we have far less control over these little kingdoms than we ever thought that these kingdoms are far more fragile than we ever realized. For our businesses, it, it took about a week for people to start uh, having COVID-19 in, in Ontario 
for for our country than to close the borders and begin completely shutting down the economy and businesses. And completely out of our control, we began to get this image that, and begin to see that our business, our company, our job is far more fragile than we once thought. That we have far less control over it than we realized. For our busy schedules, when the lockdown came and when we started practicing social distancing, suddenly we couldn't play sports anymore. We couldn't keep ourselves as busy and our lives began to feel out of control. Our rhythms were completely messed up. And this little kingdom we built of our athletic empire, whatever it was, it was revealed to us just how fragile it really is. For our academics, you know, we still get grades and we've still been getting classes online, but this academic empire we've built is, this academic little human kingdom we've built has shown to be very fragile and very out of our control. Doing things online is very hard. You know, for me, graduating from seminary this spring, a thought came through my mind, I might never be able to walk across a stage. And I, I've put all this time and effort into getting all these grades, these good grades, but I still might never be able to rock across the stage. I'll still receive my diploma, but it's just not the same. And then our bodies. I heard someone say that COVID-19, the, the 19 stands for the 19 pounds we've all gained <laughs> through this time of lockdown. We've, we were so diligent. We had such good self-control, but then we couldn't go to the gym anymore. Our rhythms were completely messed up. It's so hard to eat properly when you're stuck at home day after day. And all these little kingdoms and this time of 2020 and this time of the pandemic have been proven to be so very fragile, so very out of our control in many ways. And it is unsettling book I've been reading lately is called Playing with Fire. It's by uh, the author. Her name is um, Bianca Juarez Olthoff. And she talks about control in her book. She writes this. What is control? She is a woman with fabulous hair and defined biceps. She is a straight A student, the high achieving executive. She is always two steps ahead. Her favorite word is is yes, and she could deliver results to anyone. And although control is impossible to pin down, I chased her. I wanted to be her. I thought I could be her. I followed control's lead, her hair, biceps, straight A's, and all. I said yes to everyone. Yes made me feel like I was in control and that the outcome depended on me and the results depended on me alone. Yes gave me the illusion that I could deliver joy and happiness to others as well as myself. If you take this demanding job, you'll have the financial freedom you've always wanted. Yes, I'll take it, I said. If you copy this essay, you'll be a guaranteed A. Yes, I'll do it, I said. If you try this diet pill, it'll make you lose 24 pounds in 24 hours. Yes, I'll pop that pill. But control is a manipulator. She promises what can't be had. She promises perfection. While I chased after control and envied her apparent freedom, God called after me. He tried to remind me that control was my own construct. God knew the futility of my attempts. And like a patient father, he waited for me to understand that I needed to entrust my life to him. Even though Bianca, King Nebuchadnezzar, and we have received this apocalypse, this unsettling apocalypse about a lack of control, there's still comfort. Comfort that God is communicating to each of us 
And even though we are not in complete control, it's okay because God is. God has always been in control. That's part of what he's trying to reveal to us, that he is the sovereign God who has control over these little kingdoms that we think belong to us. He is the God who is building a kingdom that will take up the entire earth like that mountain in the dream, a kingdom that will last forever, a kingdom that is very different than the little human kingdoms that we try to build. Interestingly, in this story of Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar is told by Daniel that the meaning of this dream, that that it's about his kingdom and just how fragile it is and how it's eventually going to be destroyed and, and God is going to build his own kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't lash out in continued anger. You think this would make him even more angry and say, say immediately, kill this man, Daniel, who's told me this. But what does he do? He bows down in worship to this God that Daniel has spoken of. Nebuchadnezzar was becoming aware that just how little control he had, just how out of control things seemed. And so he clinged to, clung to the most solid thing that he could find. And that is the one true God, the God of Daniel, certainly a solid thing to cling to. Nebuchadnezzar, even if it was just for this chapter, because we read in chapter 3 of Daniel that this feeling doesn't last for long within him, but Nebuchadnezzar begins to give up control to God and to trust in his sovereignty just in this moment, realizing that he is the God of gods, the God of kings, the revealer of mysteries. But there's even more good news packed in this apocalypse to Nebuchadnezzar beyond just realizing that God has been in control the entire time. And it has to do with that strange rock, that rock that is not cut by human hands, the divine rock, that rock that breaks the statue and turns into this mountain. See, this divine rock is a prophecy about Jesus about Jesus, the living stone, our solid rock, who established God's kingdom, began to establish God's kingdom right here on earth. I want to read for you a passage from 1 Peter. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. As Pastor Eric said at the beginning of this series, the, the apocalypse that God gives to us leads to Jesus. Jesus is the apocalypse. Jesus is this stone not cut by human hands, this solid rock that establishes a very different kind of kingdom among us, a kingdom of peace, of justice, of love, of grace, a kingdom that is slowly but surely being established right here on earth among us. A kingdom that isn't going to end and going to be taken over by some other kingdom after it. No, a kingdom that will last into eternity. Jesus is our solid rock. Jesus is the solid rock that Daniel, that all the people of God can cling to, that they they looked forward to and that we can trust in that his kingdom will never end. And that when it seems like all our kingdoms are coming crumbling down, when we realize just how fragile they really are, we can trust that Jesus is building a forever kingdom, a kingdom that we get to be a part of as living stones being built into a spiritual house 
built upon the cornerstone that is Jesus Christ, the rock not cut by human hands. God is apocalypsing to us the fragility of our own personal kingdoms right now, just as he revealed apocalypse to Nebuchadnezzar, the fragility of that kingdom. And although it's unsettling, we can find some comfort within that apocalypse. And that comfort is that we get to be a part of a forever kingdom. And that even though we aren't in complete control, God is. God has got us. God has got us in the palm of his hand. God is reminding of us, us of his new kingdom that he is building through Jesus Christ and establishing here on earth. And this doesn't mean that we we don't do the things that I talked about, those examples I gave. It doesn't mean that we, we no longer participate in sports or take care of our bodies or, or build our own businesses and, and work in this economy. But it means that as we do those things, we do them in service to the one true God, to the one who is in control, knowing that if things go south, if things seem like they're going to fall apart, it's okay. Because God, our God, the revealer of mysteries, is sovereign. I want to share a story, a story from a family in our church that really is a good example of that. It's a story from Peter and Jackie Beerling, uh, a family here at Emmanuel CRC. Peter and Jackie, oh, Pete has, has owned a business for a very long time, a business called Manuflex. And before he owned it, he worked for it. And for most of his life, his, it was dedicated to Manuflex. This, I think it was a, a, a steel machinist company. And in very many ways, this kind of was Pete's personal kingdom, Pete and Jackie's personal kingdom. But uh, even before 2020, kind of to the end of 2019, things began to become clear to them that they should consider selling the business giving up control. And it was a hard decision and they had to work through it through some trusted Christian friends here and through a lot of prayer and discernment on their own, but they decided that this was what was best. And so they decided to give up control and they came to, they, they came to a place of peace in that decision. But giving up control rose up, uh, arose new worries to them. What next? Now that Pete couldn't work for Manuflex anymore, where would he work now? How, how would the sale go now that they decided to sell it? Would it be messy? Would it be difficult? Could they find the right buyer? How would it all work? There's a lot of worry uh, around them as they realized just how little control they had over the situation. But in the middle of that, Pete read a devotional devotional from a, a devotional book called Jesus Calling, which speaks through the words of Jesus directly to us as readers. And, and it, I'm going to read a bit of it here. It said this, you are on the path of my choosing. There's no randomness about your life. As you give yourself more and more to a life of constant communion with me, you'll find that you simply have no time for worry. Thus, you are free to let my spirit direct your steps, enabling you to walk the path of peace. And wonderfully, almost miraculously, right in the midst of all this this unsettledness for Pete and Jackie, God spoke this to him through his devotional. And it spoke directly into their feelings of worry. Even though they were not in control, they knew that, that God was in control, that their sovereign God, he had them in the palm of his hand. And Pete told me that even though this whole process of selling the business didn't go exactly as he had planned, he never intended when he bought Manuflex to became the owner to, to, to sell it off this early. But he, has, he admitted that it's so much better that God was in control. 
that even though he wasn't in control, God, it's better that God is, was the one directing and taking care of his life and Jackie's life and the life of his family. So for each of us who are experiencing this unsettledness and uncertainty in this time, through this apocalypse that we've experienced that is 2020, that is COVID-19, know that God has got you. Know that he is completely in control. He is the one that, that puts kings into power and takes them out of power. He is the one that is establishing his kingdom here on earth. And we get to be a part of that. We get to keep working hard, keep taking care of ourselves, keep doing the things that are for the life of ourselves and the life of our communities, but we do them in service to God. Knowing that we're not building our own little kingdoms, but we are just simply being a part of his kingdom. Know, know that we are not alone, that we are not our own, but we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our solid rock. So in these unsettling and uncertain times, let's cling to God's kingdom, to that rock, the cornerstone, not cut by human hands, Jesus Christ, to this kingdom that God is establishing that will never end. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
your hidden glory in creation is now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, how beautiful is your name, Lord God. We worship you. We give you praise. We give you honor for your unshakable name, your unshakable power, your unshakable love. Thank you that while we may feel shaky, we are never shaken, for we stand on a firm foundation. And that's because of you. Amen. People of God, as you go out into your week, into these continually unsettling and uncertain times, go with God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turns his face toward you and gives you his peace now and forever. <laughs>